Let me tell you a story about a couple of guys who were on an airplane heading back to uh, Virginia, landing in Richmond. Two men were sitting on a plane. One asked the other, sir, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? He says, yes, I do. In fact, I'm a minister. Well, fantastic. He says, are you a Protestant or a Catholic? He says, I'm a Protestant. Well, that's great. So am I. Are you conservative or liberal in your theology? He says, I'm happy to say that I'm a conservative. Incredible, so am I. If you don't ask, uh, mind me asking, are you Lutheran or Presbyterian, Methodist or Baptist? He says, well, I'm a Baptist. <laughs> what a divine appointment of God's providence. I'm a Baptist too. Well, are you a Northern Baptist, an Independent Baptist, a Free Will Baptist, or a Southern Baptist? He says, by education and choice, I'm a Southern Baptist. Unbelievable, the guy says. So am I. So do you hold to the 1689 London Baptist Confession or the 1833 New Hampshire Baptist Confession, the Baptist Faith and Message 1963 or the Baptist Faith and Message 2000? And I know for many of you go, I have no idea what he just said, but it's okay. Well, he says, uh, I hold to the Baptist Faith and Message 2000. Well, praise the Lord. This is truly astounding. We are kindred spirits by God's sovereign grace. The two of us have met here on this plane and we're united. Tell me, which Bible translation do you preach from? The ESV, the KJV, the New King James, or the NIV? He says, though I appreciate them all, I use the ESV. This is a miracle, the man says. One more question, if you do, uh, don't mind. Do you follow college football? Why, yes, I'm a big fan. Well, do you root for the Virginia Tech Ho Hokies? Is that it? Uh, uh, do you root for UVA Cavaliers? The man says, I root for the Cavaliers, of course. Uh, one laugh in the whole room. Well, with that, the first man ceased to smile. Called the man a lost sinner at best and a devilish heretic at worst. He turned away, refused to speak to the man any further. Obviously, he rooted for the other team. And just for the record, I'm a Liberty's Flame fan. <laughs> Which, by the way, today there are two teams playing in the Super Bowl. I could care less about either of them. But for the record, I am going to root for the Rams because uh, their quarterback graduated from the University of Georgia. You, you can pick your favorites, whatever. It was fascinating as you read through this and hear this, this dialogue. It happens more frequently than we'd like to admit. Satan loves to divide people when you get down to the nitty gritty and split fine hairs between things. We can always find things that we agree with, but too often we look for things that we disagree with that divide. And Satan loves to divide churches. He loves to divide families. He loves to divide people based on disunity. One of the major dangers of every church and every household is disunity. As I'm focusing on love as a community, and certainly, uh, I mean, this is love weekend, people, you know, talking about Valentine's and whatever, and, and, uh, and there are some who uh, are excited about this weekend and some who are hurting this weekend. But disunity is what, uh, what has split so many places and so many people. We all want to experience harmony and peace that comes from unity, but unity comes with a price. It takes hard work to keep unity. How many of you have been married more than five minutes and realize it takes work to keep unity in the household? Yeah, and if you had a child in there and just, you know, and all the ebbs and flows, achieving unity and maintaining unity is hard work. Sometimes we think unity is achieved if we just do away with any disagreements, any conflict. But unity is not the absence of conflict. Unity is the growth through it. That you become more unified the more you go through difficulties together and begin to work and, and, and be shaped by the situation and how God will grow you. This is the fruitful result of working through it. And what I know about a, a, in, in a Christian household and in, a, in the church is that Christ unifies us spiritually within the church and he works through the unification of practicality as we deal with every new opportunity. 
We all need to make some personal commitments to protecting what matters. Unity is essential in our household and in the church, and we have to work to protect unity with every challenge. The Apostle Paul is teaching the Corinthian church, and I'm going to ask that you turn to 1 Corinthians. We're going to look at chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3. Out of all the New Testament churches, this one is the one who had the most disunity, the most challenges and struggles. And so I want you to look at 1 Corinthians. Paul is teaching a church here that is battling factions that fractured the church. They couldn't even get the Lord's Supper right when they had communion in uh, 1 Corinthians 11. There was challenges there. But together, I think we can learn from Paul and, and this church the lessons of how to protect the unity within the church. In pursuit of unity, the church must pursue humility, and that's an overriding theme in Paul's writings here. One of the first problems that Paul dealt with in the church came from a puffed-up view. First Corinthian Christians had shifted their focus off Jesus and onto individual people. They'd become prideful, focusing on human leaders and individual strategies. And this is still a 21st century problem, just like it was in the first century. So we need to protect the unity of the church. And I'm going to give you four or three areas that Paul says focus on if you want to protect the unity of the church which I believe also is transferable right into your home. The first thing he's going to show us is in chapter 1. I want you to look down at verse 10. After he gives us general welcome in the first few verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he goes down to verse 10, and he says, I appeal to you, brothers. Perhaps in your translation it says, exhort you, to you, brothers. This is from the Greek word parakaleo, which uh, this is where the Holy Spirit is our paraclete. He, he's our comforter. He's the one who comes alongside. Paul is stepping back into this church and he's saying, listen, I want to come alongside you. I'm, I'm appealing to you. We've, I can't walk away from this. I forget. All right. I'm appealing to you. I'm walking along because I, I know what's happening here. There's divisions among you and I need to come alongside you and, and, and pull things together. We need to correct your sinful disunity. Here he's going to begin to focus on, if there's point number one, you gotta, he wants you to focus on the message of the gospel over the ministry of a group. I'm appealing to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. He goes right there because he knows there's divisions in the church. He says, let's focus on Jesus. Because that's, that's where you began to drift, and there's no hope of unity unless Christ is the center of our focus. He says that all of you agree, and there would be no divisions among you. Divisions. Schemata is the Greek word. We get our word schism. Separation. It's the same word, literally, that they use for tear apart or rip apart. That, that, it, it, that Things like their, their nets, the fishing nets that would tear apart, use the same word. And then rather than being uh, uh, divided, he says that, that, that you would be united, be made complete. Same word that they use for mending the nets or, or, or healing bones, coming back together. When something's been broken, it needs to be united or, or mended back together. Unity is missing in this church, and he has to go right after it. He didn't give them three chapters of, oh, I hope everybody's doing well. How's Aunt Sarah? You know, how's this? How's that? No, he goes right after it because he knew he's got to get their attention because they won't hear a thing unless they unite under the gospel. He says that you be united in the same mind, in the same judgment. What's dividing them here at this stage? In verse 11, he begins to unpack how personalities are dividing, whether the individuals they're uh, identifying are, are attempting to do that, or it's just the followers. But in verse 11, he says, For it has been reported to me that Chloe's people, uh, by Chloe's people, that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, Well, I follow Paul. Or I follow Apollos, 
or I follow Cephas, or even I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Once again, se separated, schemata, it's, it's been ripped apart. Is Christ ripped apart? No. Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? See, the Corinthians wanted to be identified more with who baptized them than the one who saved them. This happens in church world all over. You know, we could sit here and go through a list. Are you, are, are you Presbyterian or are you Baptist? Are you Methodist? You know, uh, do you like, you know, this preacher on TV or that preacher? Do you listen to this guy or that guy? And we divide based on personalities that we prefer. Are we all on the same team going the same direction? Or are we dividing Christ's church unnecessarily? He goes right after it. He says, you need to protect the unity. Fractured fellowship robs Christians of pure joy and effective ministry. You know, in James chapter 4, it says, What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source of your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust, you do not have, so you commit murder. Are you envious and cannot obtain, so you fight in your quarrel? It states that the cause of many conflicts, quarrels, and fighting is selfish desire. Though forbidden by God, tragically, division is totally out of character of our redeemed nature. Christ takes broken people and brings them together. How is it that the church and, and families divide and str uh, be struggled rather than focus on Christ? They, they look at divisions. A few things demoralize, discourage, and weaken a family or a church as much as bickering, backbiting, and fighting among its members. So what's the solution? You look down at verse 14. He says, here's the solution. I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and, and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did not bapt oh, I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. And I can just imagine some member of the church going, he baptized me and he forgot my name. It happened. The emphasis here is not that Paul's saying, you know, it doesn't matter if you're baptized or not. It doesn't matter, who, you know, who baptized you. Baptism is essential. You know, we're called to go baptize. You know, go there uh, throughout the world and, and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's a, that's a command. That's the Great Commission. But the emphasis here is not that baptism is uh, unimportant. It just doesn't take precedence over the one who saved you so you can become baptized. It's not about this pastor or that preacher or this person. He says, listen, verse 17, for Christ did not send me to baptize. Meaning that's not the emphasis. He sent me to preach the gospel. And not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. What unifies people is the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is how Jews and Gentiles of the first century could go to the same congregation of worship. They were both sinners lost from God and being brought together by the grace and gospel of Jesus. The message of the gospel is more important than any ministry of a group. Even Paul was named among these groups and he, he distanced himself from those who said, well, I follow Paul. He's like, none of it. You know, in the great... Protestant Reformation in, uh, in, 15, in the 1500s. Martin Luther led that. And he says the, the reason why he was, he was trying to reform the Catholic Church because they had stopped focusing on Christ and what the Bible actually said. And so as he began to preach, his goal was to reform the Catholic Church. I got to move once in a while. And People began to follow him there in Germany and some other places, and, and so they would call themselves Lutherans. You ever heard of them? And Martin Luther said, don't do that. It's not about me. This is my present-day vernacular. It's not about me. It's about Christ. Don't call yourself a Lutheran. But we have a whole denomination of Lutherans because they followed the teachings of Luther, though that was never his desire. It, it's the same thing here Paul is saying. Don't, don't call yourself a, a, a Paulite. Just follow Christ. Paul, Apollos, Peter, and any other apostle that came along, 
is the same as any Christian, that we're all called by the same grace of Jesus. Let's just follow him and unify under that. No person, no ministry is more important than the other. The gospel must take priority when it comes to budgets, it comes to leadership, it comes to direction. It's never about a person or a ministry that's more important within the church. It's not about preferences. It's about unifying the church under the gospel where we must work to know the gospel, show the gospel, and share the gospel with everyone. Turn to chapter 2, because he's not done. He's going to speak on this division again, but he's going to say, okay, so if we're, we're under the gospel, then how do we begin to strategize? How do we begin to, to make progress? In the first few verses here, Paul is very clear. It's going to be about the Spirit's wisdom over the strategy of the world. He's not going to rely, Paul's not going to rely on a polished personality, a, any power that he has, or a, a specific presentation style. In verse 1, he says, And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing ex uh, among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. It's not about how polished he was, and, and Paul was not um, an uneducated man. He was one of the most educated men of his time. He certainly could, could uh, preach a message that would be compelling and, and engaging. But he, he says right at the beginning, it's not about, uh, I'm not one of the philosophers of the day. I'm preaching the gospel, and this is what I'm going to give you. He didn't come as a philosopher of wisdom or, or, or any uh, uh, education in a sense that he's he putting that, his degrees, before everything else. He's simply a personal witness of what he has experienced and what he knows from the truth. He didn't come to pontificate his thoughts, but to proclaim Jesus alone. When we gather for worship, when we gather in Bible studies, wherever we are, I hope that we don't just gather so we can hear each other's opinions on politics, on even religion or world events, economics, psychology. Sometimes those are groups that uh, uh, gather together, but it won't take long to divide those groups because we'll find differences. When we gather together, if Christ isn't preeminent and the Bible isn't what to the standard of your teaching, then it's not really designed like Christ desires. Make Christ and the gospel, the Bible, be the standard. Make it be the, the, the barriers by which you're going to speak. That's the only thing that's going to give us hope in life. Human opinions typically confuse and divide. But God's word will edify and it'll unify. I think of Paul speaking to the younger pastor, Timothy. Listen to some of these words that he gave him in 1 Timothy 4. He says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by the, devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons, though, uh, and throw the, uh, the, through the in, insincerity of liars whose uh, consciences are seared. So he's warning him even there, Hey, there's going to be some different teachings come in, not from the Scriptures. It's going to divide and people are going to depart. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13, he says, Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, and to teaching. Why would you want to do that? Because the Scripture is the only truth that we know is absolutely unchanging. In 2 Timothy, he picks up on the same theme. He tells Timothy, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. He didn't say preach philosophy, pick up the latest copy of Christianity Today or Time magazine and, and share those thoughts. He says, preach the word. He goes on, he says, be ready in season and out of season. I've often wondered, what does that mean? What is in season, out of season? Well, whatever it is, it means you preach it all the time. There probably are seasons when people are more receptive to the Bible. Remember after 9-11, some of you weren't born yet, but after 9-11, man, the churches were filled within the next few weeks. The Bible was in season. A couple of months later, churches' attendance dropped by you know, 50%. 
The Bible was out of season. So what should preachers do? Preach the Bible, the Word, whether it's in season or out of season. Because people need the truth. People will blow with the wind, but the Bible never changes. And for 21 centuries, people have tried to eliminate it, burn it, burn people at the stake because of it. And it still stands. It's the thing that unifies the Spirit's wisdom. He says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears that will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. When Paul preached, he determined to know nothing except Jesus Christ because that he's the only one who can change lives, change families, change cultures, and change the church. You notice he says in verse 3, it's not about his personality in, in verse 1 and 2. In, in verse 3, he says, it's not about my power. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And I'm thinking, was Paul really weak? Paul was a very strong individual. He was a powerful individual. He, he, he spoke with boldness. He, he spoke before councils that were going to uh, uh, crucify him. But when he says here, I, I came to you in weakness, I mean, he didn't come in his own strength. He came in the power of God. If there's any power to, to be obtained, it's God's power working through you. Verse 4, he talks about his own presentation style. He came in fear and trembling. He says, my speech and my message were not implausible words of wisdom, in the days of all the philosophers, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith may not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of of God. Oh, how essential is that? You know, some of you, I know, hesitate to share the gospel with anybody, you know, with your own family sometimes or, or with friends, co-workers or any place. You're like, I don't know. I, I may not have the right words. You know, I'm not as polished as so-and-so or I, I don't know. I, I might fumble all over. Let me just encourage you. If you got the truth, just share it. Even if you stumble along the way, because the Spirit of God takes the, the, the Word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit, and He will pierce the heart just by sharing the truth. It's not about your presentation style. Some of the greatest evangelists I have ever heard of, not on the platform, but just in conversations, are those who go, I don't know a lot, but I'll tell you what. And he tells the, the gospel, tells his testimony, and people come to Christ because of that. They'll never have a big audience, but they're very effective because it's not about their power, wisdom, or strength. It's about God working through a humble servant who's willing to just open their lips and share what they know. You ought to applaud God because he works even through the weakest vessels in this room. When you just say yes to God, whatever, you're, whatever you want to do with me, you, I'm going to let you work through me and I'm going to stop making excuses. Like Moses in the Old Testament, well, I, oh, I, 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 I can't do this. Well, fine, you're going to take your brother Aaron. You know, uh, uh, we're going to work through this. You know, and, and I love Esther, who, who uh, you know, is, is told to basically rescue the people in the Old Testament that, that, there in Persia, that has to go before the king. And, and she finally goes, you know, she doesn't know if she's going to be effective or not, but she trusted God enough to say, you know what, I'm going to go to the king, and if I perish, I perish. Wow, we need some people who, uh, who cling on to that kind of truth. I'll just put myself out there, let God in his strength and wisdom work through me, and whatever he wants to, to be the result, I'll be content with. But I'm not going to withhold the opportunity for God to use me so I can glorify him. We ought to be much more bold than that. That's what unifies the church. No matter how impressive or persuasive, human wisdom will always rob the gospel of its power. Paul never leaned on calculated theatrics. He never wanted techniques to manipulate a response. There are many in my profession that, that manipulate things to, to get an emotional response from people. They'll go, they'll go on foreign mission trips and, oh, we had thousands saved. 
but they never shared the gospel, but they got an emotional response from people. See, without a true understanding and conviction of the gospel, salvation doesn't really happen. We can all tell a weepy story and get you crying, but do we know God and His Word? Because if it's not prompted from God's Word, it's not of God. We need to unify around the truth rather than human persuasive techniques. Even Jonathan Edwards, one of the greatest preachers of our, uh, from our uh, country, actually read his sermons. He didn't walk around like I do. <laughs> he rarely looked up from, from the page. He read his sermons so that he would not be guilty of using human persuasion to bring people to Christ. He says, I just want the truth that I've studied to be proclaimed, and what people do with that, it's based on the Spirit of God's promptings. That's powerful. And what's true for the Corinthian church, that they, they shouldn't rest on the strategies of the world, but just the uh, Spirit's wisdom is true for us today. I want you to go to chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians. He's going to touch on that the power of God over performance of a person. Paul established that we're all in this together, and he reiterates the importance of unity for this church. Picking up on verse 5, he says, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? He's going back to chapter 1's uh, examples. He says, servants through whom you believed. I mean, we're servants being used of God. We spoke, we spoke up, we told you the truth, and God used that to draw you to himself as the Lord assigned to each. In verse 6, one of the most powerful uh, verses you ought to memorize so you'd remind, be reminded of your place in this, uh, in this Christian journey. I planted, Apollos watered. But what does it say in your translation? Read it out loud. Where did the power come from? God. Every farmer knows I can plant the seed, but I can't make it grow. If you were to go plant some seeds in your backyard... And you go out every day and you try to dig them up to see if there's any movement, uh, you would actually be destroying the process. You plant, you water, but only God can bring the growth. But here's the thing. Are you planting? Are you watering? You notice that Paul was planting and Apollos was watering, but only God brings the growth? Look at verse 7. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything. Well, certainly there's something. They're doing something. But it's not about them. Once again, it's not about them. They're just simply obeying the Lord by planting and watering, but only God who gives the growth. The, Paul's emphasis here is the cure of division is turning away from self or focusing on, on what we can do and turning our eyes towards the one whom we all glorify who will bring the growth. Growth in our relationship, growth in the unity, growth in the impact in the, in the world that we live in, expressing the testimony of what God can do with broken people as he unifies them together. In verse 8, he says, and he who plants and he who waters are one. It's not about Paul. It's not about Apollos. It's not about the next person down the road. It's, it, we are unified. We are one. And each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are, in verse 9, for we are God's fellow workers. Fellow workers united to accomplish God's uh, calling. Notice that Paul considers himself here. And Paul's one of the greatest leaders of all time. Notice Paul considers himself a fellow worker. I'm just one of you. We may have different roles, but we're all on the same team. The team who wins the Super Bowl today is the one who's most united and working in, in conjunction with one another, not fighting against each other. Imagine a quarterback stepping into the huddle. He calls a play. They get up to the, to the, to the line, and, and the center says, you know, I want to go on count seven, not count three. Have you ever been to a football game or watched this where the entire team is off sides except for the center? Because in football, if you don't understand, the play doesn't start until the center moves the ball. He snaps the ball. And I, I saw Liberty do it this year. He didn't snap the ball, but everybody went forward. That's offsides. You have to work in unison. What if a quarterback drops back because he's supposed to throw to the guy on the far right? And that guy decides, you know what? I'd rather just sit here. I'm a little tired. And he doesn't run. What if a running back thinks he's going to get the ball and he goes and the quarterback wants to throw it? And, and rather than being able to get the ball as a running back and run forward, he has to just tackle the quarterback to get the ball from him. 
I've seen some teams like this. I'll confess, I was on a team like that for one year in high school. <laughs> we couldn't get anything right. But we would laugh at that. But you know what? Churches are like this too. Hey, here's the play we're running. We're going to move forward. We're going to march and reach the people. They go, well, I want to do something else. I want to go this direction. I want to go that direction. Let's do this, 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 this. And we're so divided and we're not effective at anything. It's one of the areas he's, he's concerned about. Are you working in your own power? Or are you working unified under the power of God that he would get the glory because he's the one who grows it? The beauty of this passage tells me, too, unity does not mean uniformity. Uniformity, we're all exactly the same. Listen, we're not all the same. How many of you married somebody exactly like you? One of you is unnecessary, if that's true. My wife or, uh, you know, Jennifer and I are exactly opposite. It doesn't matter what the personality uh, profiles you do or, or any uh, list of, hey, what would you prefer? I mean, she's the beach, I'm the mountains. You know, uh, she's the extrovert, I'm more naturally introverted. I mean, we're exact opposite on everything. You know, she's a peacemaker and I'm a troublemaker. I mean, it just works out this way. And together, we've been able to unify. It has some growth through that, but we have to unify through that so that we can raise another generation of believers who love Jesus. The same thing happens in your home. It doesn't, matter. We, it doesn't mean we all have to agree on everything. My wife and I don't agree on anything sometimes. We work it out. But we, sometimes we come to a thing, and she has a totally different perspective than I do. And I'm like, what are you thinking? You know, and in my, my domineering way, sometimes I go, well, we ought to just do it this way. But you know what? Sometimes she has the most wisdom, and I've been pa you know, uh, patient enough to listen and go, you know what? I think you're actually right. Or, hey, here's a modified version that's even better than what you or I came up with. And then we march forward together. This is so needed in our homes. It's so needed in our church that we are not all exactly alike, and that's a good thing. But even in our differences, some will water, some will plant. Some will support. Some will, you know, will, will, will run mis missions down the street. Some will go across the world. Some will be that, that, the behind the scenes taking care of a lot of things. Like those who help with baptism. Oh, thank you so much. What happens behind the scenes with baptism? Or, or, or behind the scenes putting uh, bags of candy together that you can get today when you leave. Isn't that exciting? You know, all these things behind the scenes. And then some are up front. All of us together are different, but all of us can be unified. It's kind of like how your car, you got here today in a vehicle, and not one part in the car is exactly the same. But all together, they work to get you where you're going. And that's what Paul's saying here, the power of God over the performance of an individual. He speaks about this to the Corinthians later in chapter 12 about spiritual gifts. There is one body but many parts. But focusing on Christ will be the unifying factor that will help them overcome division. The rest of verse 9 and, and going to verse 10 says, You are God's field, one field. You are God's building, one building, all different parts, but you're building up to glorify God. Verse 10, according to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid the foundation. Someone else uh, came uh, and built upon it. Let each one take care of how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which has been laid. And what is that foundation? Jesus Christ. That's how this 116-year-old church will continue for another 116 years. There is no other foundation but Jesus Christ. He was crucified, buried, and rose from the grave. And he is powerful to still save people today as we preach the gospel and we love one another. West Lynchburg, as well as many other churches, have to stop relying upon one way of doing things as if it's the only way. Churches are closing down all across the United States because they were unwilling to adjust to the culture in order to reach people with the unchanging gospel. We need to learn what God is doing in our generation, in our community, to reach the people all around us. West Lynchburg has to create a culture that pursues Jesus and not individual preferences. 
It was Dwight Moody in Chicago who said, I have never yet known the Spirit of God to work where the people of God were divided. It was Dwayne Elmer who said, the destruction of unity is the destruction of something that God has made holy. Any activity contributing to the disunity that contributes to the distortion of people seeing God's glory. If you contribute to the disunity, you're contributing to the distortion from people seeing God's glory. If you desire to abide in God's presence, to understand the peace and the holiness of God, we have to seek His peace through working together and unifying towards the resolutions over any difficulties, problems, or disagreements among our brothers and sisters. And it's possible. If Jesus can unify Jews and Gentiles, if he can unify between foreign cultures and other cultures together, if in heaven when we gather together, every nation uh, under, the, uh, under the sun is going to be there, unified together, if he can do it, he can do it here, and he can do it in this community. I'm praying for the day when our churches can be unified here and we work together. There's so much disunity among all the churches in, in Lynchburg, and it breaks my heart. But I want to be a part of the solution as I'm working towards that. Same thing here. We need to be unified under the gospel of Christ and the mission that he's given us. How many of you, are, you remember the uh, Peanuts cartoon? Or a little, little comic strip. Peanuts, Charlie Brown, that whole thing. One time, Linus and, and, uh, and Lucy were, were together, and he was uh, watching television, and Lucy comes in and changes the channel. He says, hey, you can't do that. She says, yes, I can. He says, what reason do you have to do this? She goes, I have five reasons. She held up her fingers. One, two, three, four, five. I got five reasons why we can, you know, I can change the channel for my thing. And so Linus looks at his hand and says, how come you guys can't get together like that? There is power in unity, yes? <laughs> you know, God's power is seen most when people unify for the mission to go forward. 